Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Daily Grey Refuel, where I recap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Anthony Sassano, and today is the 26th of January, 2021. Right, everyone, let's get into the news from the last 24 hours. So, some personal news, as they like to say. So, I announced on Twitter yesterday, or I guess earlier today, for, for some of you, was uh, that I um, have left set as a as like a full time person employed at set. Uh, I used to be used to be as of like a couple of days ago. I was a product marketing manager at set. Uh, I had worked there for eighteen months uh, since mid twenty nineteen. Joined in July of twenty nineteen. I'm pretty sure. Uh, and now I have stepped down to an advisory position with the company. Uh, and I said here on Twitter that I now work full time for Ethereum and the open internet. And I've got a thread here, I'll link it in the YouTube description if you haven't seen it yet and you want to read it there. But basically what I mean by this is that, you know, Ethereum has given me a lot over the years, uh, over the four years that I've been in this ecosystem. And I've obviously tried to give a lot back through the Daily Gway, through Ethub, my work at Set, you know, my Twitter presence, all that sort of stuff. And now I'm kind of in a position in my life where I can take this kind of to the next level and and essentially work for myself, um, you know, support myself and, and work for Ethereum, uh, basically. So that means, you know, more daily grade content is going to be coming at you, you know, doing more stuff with EthHub, um, being more involved with like earlier stage projects. I love to help early stage projects from both an advisory position perspective or just, you know, jumping on a call and helping them through different things like marketing, community management, you know, all the communications, all that sort of stuff, because there's going to be a lot of projects spinning up uh, in the coming years, because, you know, De DeFi, Ethereum is just exploding, that they're definitely going to need help, because navigating the this ecosystem is actually quite difficult um, from, I guess, like a marketing and, and um, community perspective, because there's a lot of insider kind of baseball that you need to know. Uh, you need to know, like, you know, how the community reacts to certain things, you know, the, the have a pulse of the community of, like, what they like, what they don't like, you know, the memes, um, you know, what works and what doesn't from a product perspective as well within DeFi, what people are interested in, what people want, what's been tried before, which failed because of this, this, and this reason. So, you know, there's a million different things going on there, but that's where I think, you know, I can, I can help and add a lot of value, so... Yeah, it feels really, really great to be able to, uh, you know, take my, I guess, my personal work full time. Um, you know, set working with Set for the for the last eighteen months has been awesome. The team is great. Uh, I truly believe they're building products that are going to change the world. You know, I'm sure you're all aware of the DeFi Pulse Index. You know, one of the most popular products Set has has kind of like launched with the Index Co-op, and there's just more and more coming. Uh, I, 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 you know, I'm I'm really excited, and that's why. Instead of just leaving the company altogether, I really wanted to stay on in an advisory position because I really wanted to be involved with their success. I, I, I definitely think they're going far there. So a little bit of a shill, but if you're sleeping on set protocol or index cop or any of the stuff that they're doing, uh, definitely don't because you'll be you'll be missing out on some really cool stuff. So yeah, and uh, if if you're if anyone watching or listening to this is you know. Maybe you have a project that you're thinking of spinning up or you're in the early stages and you need some advice or anything. I'm always available and happy to help. You know, just DM me on Twitter, on Telegram. My Telegram handle is the same as my Twitter handle. So Sassel0x here. Um, so you can just DM me there and, and I'll, I'll, I'll definitely answer uh, within, you know, 24 hours normally. And yeah, always happy to help the earlier stage projects. So yeah, looking forward to that. And yeah, looking forward to providing more content on the Daily Gway, you know, through, through YouTube, through, um, you know, the, the newsletter, I might take that a little bit further and do, do some cool stuff there. I've got a few ideas of what I want to do. I uh, just, I need to just kind of like plan out my life now, <laughs> now that I've got like all this, um, all this time, I got to allocate it, you know, as, as uh, I think is best effective. I don't want to just like sit here and, and, and kind of like have all this time and not do anything with it. I'm, I'm always kind of someone who wants to be as involved as I can with, with kind of, um, you know, the ecosystem. And I think, you know, Ethereum is going to change the world. So, very happy that I get to still be part of that um, in, a, in, a, in a kind of like grander capacity, I guess you could say. So anyway, enough about me. There's a lot of news to get through today. So let's get into it. So Larry Sermak from the blog put out this uh, tweet today, uh, basically saying, and I'll quote the tweet, the, while the vast majority of institutional capital is flowing into Bitcoin, every single standout candidate we have interviewed at the block recently was drawn into DeFi, not a single one that was focused only on Bitcoin, end quote. I thought this was really cool and really bullish because it's just a sign of the times, right? 
what's happening with Bitcoin, not to insult Bitcoin, but if you're a new person coming into this ecosystem, you know, maybe you come in through Bitcoin, you learn all about Bitcoin, learn what it's about. And then, you know, you, you obviously will discover Ethereum too, right? And then you come into Ethereum and you're like, okay, Ethereum can do all of, all of, all of this. Ethereum can basically do what Bitcoin does, but like so much more. And then there's just a wider kind of pool of things to do on Ethereum and, and a, kind of cast a wider net that you're inevitably going to get more of this talent interested in things happening on Ethereum, like DeFi, you know, NFTs, DAOs, things like that, right? Rather than just being interested in in Bitcoin. Um, and, and, you know, it really is, I mean, not to, again, not to insult kind of like Bitcoin, but I just, for, for me personally, I don't know what they do when the price isn't going up. I, I really don't. There's just not much happening um, from the day to day. You know, maybe there's there's a bit happening in kind of like the wider kind of global macro space where, you know, companies are buying Bitcoin for their balance sheet and all that sort of stuff. And that's that's fine. That's cool, whatever. But that's just not something that interests me, I guess. And obviously, a lot of the new people coming into the ecosystem are not interested by that either. Uh, and I kind of like, I joked to one of my friends before, I'm just like, is Bitcoin becoming like the boomer coin of, of crypto? Um, where it's just like, you know, once you kind of like a new to crypto, it's like revolutionary, right? And it's amazing. But then you, you dive deeper and you look into like Ethereum and you're like, okay, well, you know, Bitcoin's so far behind in terms of what it can do by design, don't get me wrong, but you know, that's what new people kind of see. So they're more drawn to DeFi and Ethereum, which is incredibly bullish. We need you know, as much talent as we can in DeFi. I think DeFi is in general just going to suck in so, so much talent from the traditional world, uh, especially tr traditional finance. And in a few years, we're going to reach this kind of inflection point where traditional finance can no longer ignore DeFi simply because all the talent is going to DeFi. So so like these other companies will, will be bleeding talent to DeFi, um, just like you saw when, I mean, the internet uh, kind of spun up. There's a lot of companies that bled people to, to you know, internet-based companies and stuff like that. So we're going to see the same thing play out. And maybe it doesn't even take a few years. Maybe it happens over the next couple of years, especially during a bull market. Tons of new people are going to be coming in. And they're not going to be sticking to only Bitcoin. The days of that are, are gone. It is just too, you know, boring to just stick to Bitcoin. It, it's just the stark reality of it. Um, so you can still hold Bitcoin. You can still follow along with any developments happening on there. But if you want to get to like the really the most exciting stuff happening in all of crypto, it's all on Ethereum. And that's not even just me with my obvious, obvious massive Ethereum bias. That's just the objective truth, right? There are things happening on other chains that may or may not be interesting depending on what you're after. But the vast majority, I would say over 95% of the stuff that's interesting is happening on Ethereum. The research, the development, the apps, the, the community stuff that's, that's happening, everything like that. It's, it's the majority of it is happening on, on Ethereum. So that's where a lot of people are going to go. And, and the majority of DeFi is happening on Ethereum, right? So we're going to have so much. I mean, the, the, what makes me most bullish is when we have new people flooding into the ecosystem more so than anything else, because uh, fresh blood is only a good thing. It, you know, fresh ideas come to the, to the plate. We get more businesses spun up, more apps spun up that all compete with each other, which is good for the end user. And we just kind of like get to where we want to go a lot faster than we could have. So... Yeah, I thought that was really interesting from Larry since obviously he works at the block, he's the director of research there. So he would see a lot of these a lot of these um, candidates coming through. And for him to say this is is quite big. So yeah, I thought that was, was an interesting thing to, to kind of talk about today. So the Ethereum cat herders put out their 37th update uh, yesterday. So for those who don't know, the Ethereum cat herders are basically a small group of people who monitor Ethereum 1 protocol developments and write updates on them uh, and, and kind of like help steward different things or for, for you know, for, to their namesake, they try to herd the cats essentially, right? So in this update, they go through, you know, a lot of things going on with um, ETH 1 right now. Obviously, uh, the Berlin network upgrade that I spoke about, I think a couple of days ago, is uh, the one of the biggest things happening right now. There's the YOLO v3 testnet, which is the the I think going to be the final Berlin uh, testnet before we can we can get to mainnet there. There's a bunch of other updates here around uh, ETH2. They're doing ETH2 updates now. One five five nine implement uh, implementation. Uh, the EIP IP meetings, which is basically a meeting for the Ethereum governance uh, pr process and like how, how things are shaping up there and a bunch of other things. I mean, this is a pretty chunky update here. 
Uh, so if you're interested in following along and getting updated on ETH1 client development and some ETH2 stuff in here as well, and the governance and everything, highly suggest checking this, this post out, highly suggest um, following the Ethereum Cat Herders Medium account so you get updates here. Um, they are doing the best job out of anyone in following ETH1 developments, I think. Uh, I really love reading these updates because it's kind of hard to follow along with ETH1 developments considering it's kind of split into many different places because it's decentralized. Um, I think, uh, it, yeah, it's just very, very um, good to, to keep up to date with this sort of stuff. So yeah, really, uh, you know, I guess like kudos to the team for, for putting these out. This is the 37th update. And I think they do these weekly, so 37 weeks uh, and, and going strong. So yeah, thanks to the team for putting these updates out. So Alpha Finance tweeted out today that 0.39% of the total ETH supply is now in Alpha Homora, which is one of their apps. Um, I mean, I think I've spoken about Alpha Finance before. This is one project that I'm extremely, extremely bullish on. I, uh, I have obviously because of that, I have Alpha tokens. So just a disclaimer there. But I think not just. I mean, not to. I, don't, I didn't want to talk about Alpha too much. I wanted to more talk about the fact that just more ETH is being sucked into DeFi apps, right? Like this is just one app on Ethereum, and that has zero point three nine percent of all ETH in it, right? MakerDAO has a has a has more a way more than that in it. Compound, Aave, all these apps, and then on top of that, you have ETH two staking, which has almost three million ETH in it now, which is almost three percent of the total supply, something like two point seven, two point eight, and you quickly get to a very, very large amount of the ETH supply being kind of like taken out of, of, of off the market, not out of circulation, but off the market. So, I mean, and, and that's not counting like all the, the ETH in cold storage, right? People just sitting on it waiting for, uh, I guess, um, you know, maybe to sell it one day or maybe they're just sitting on it because they don't need to need to, to sell it or they're selling it slowly or whatever. And there's tons of that, all the lost ETH, you know, tons of stuff around that. Um, and I just, when I saw this tweet, I was just like, it's just crazy. Like all this ETH is going to get sucked up. There's just not going to be much ETH left for sale. I think the last time I checked, there were less than 10% of the total ETH supply on exchanges at this point, um, which me which means, I mean, you know, you, you do need demand to match the supply. So like, you can't just say, you know, oh, something's going to be worth more because it's it's scarce, right? It can It has to be scarce, but there also has to be demand for it. So obviously there's demand for ETH, right? More people want to buy ETH. We're getting a lot more people interested in ETH. We're having institutions coming in a couple of weeks with CME, the, the CME futures launch for ETH, which is going to drive even more interest. And if only less than 10% of the supply is actually available for sale on exchanges on any given kind of day, right? That's just going to keep getting sucked up and keep getting bought. And that's what pushes the price up. Like at the end of the day, you know, there's all this technical analysis that's happening. There's all these kind of um, fundamental analysis. There's all this stuff at the end of the day. And that all kind of adds up and is cumulative. But the the law of, of uh, supply and demand is basically what drives everything here. Like the demand is driven by, uh, you know, external factors, of course, many external factors, right? It could be driven by ETH2 developments. People get more confident than ETH2 is coming along. They buy it. DeFi developments, people see that DeFi is locking up all this ETH. They're like, oh my God, I need to buy ETH. Like it's going to, you know, there's not going to be much left to, to buy. I need to buy it before it goes up. You know, people buy ETH um, to speculate on um, its use as a store of value. You know, they buy it for gas and stuff like that, right? There's, there's a lot of demand drivers for ETH, put it that way. But then when you match that with a supply side that is dwindling, right? And that is going down rapidly because everyone wants ETH. That just leads to something very magical, and that's why we see such these such reflexive price uh, rises, right? We, I mean, in 2017, it was actually a huge driver of the price because we had a lot of projects doing ICOs. They would raise all this money in ETH, and then they would keep it in their treasury. Now, this worked both ways. During 17, it worked to lock up ETH. It worked to drive a, a, a lot of demand for ETH as well, because obviously people wanted to buy these ICOs um, or, or buy into these ICOs and invest in them or whatever. But then the opposite happened during 2018 and 2019, where all this ETH wasn't locked in these treasuries, right? The treasury of, of these projects started selling and they sold a lot during 2018 and 2019. And that is a was one of the primary drivers of why the price went down. And then of course, the price going down during a bear market, people keep selling because they're like, oh, I need to get out before it falls further. And then it falls further because people think that and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Um, you know, the, a classic example of, of uh, a large ICO selling their ETH was EOS. So EOS allegedly raised $4 billion worth of ETH. They had like a, a lot of ETH. I think they had millions of ETH that they raised. And they actually ended up dumping every single last one of it 
And they didn't just dump it for dollars, they bought Bitcoin with it too. So I think that's a big reason why we saw in 2019, Bitcoin actually doubled in 2019, whereas ETH stagnated and, and stayed flat. I think ETH had so, so much sell pressure from these ICOs that it kept it down for quite a while um, and, uh, and, and longer than it should have been kept down, I think. So now we're going into a phase where we don't have ICOs having like a crap ton of ETH to sell anymore. We're pretty much at all time highs again. We have ETH supply being locked up in, in various ways, right? Within DeFi, within ETH2 staking and all the other ways I mentioned before. And this isn't going to be capital that's just going to sell like ICOs did, right? They're not just going to um, immediately sell. I mean, in, in staking, for example, a lot of that capital, I imagine, is long-term capital. They're not going to be immediately withdrawing, you know, and dumping as soon as withdrawals are enabled. Some of them will, but but I think most of it will stay. Um, so it's a more natural driver of demand. You have, uh, I think, institutional interest, which is more natural as well. And they don't kind of like panic dump, so to speak. Some of them will, but... Most of them won't, I don't I don't think. So that's another kind of like uh, a thing there to keep, I guess, the ETH price from falling as hard as it did during the last bear market. So yeah, a lot of interesting stuff happening there in the ETH's kind of um, supply side stuff. I have the um, next daily grade data pump video, which um, goes over the Ethereum on-chain analysis uh, coming out in, uh, I, can't, I think, a week, next week, if I got the dates right here. So look out for that because I'm actually going to be going over ETH supply um, uh, kind of uh, dynamics there and how it's been changing over the last couple months. So definitely subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet so you don't miss that. I think it's going to be very interesting. I was looking at it um, just today and I'm like, okay, this is really interesting. There's there's you know not much ETH left for sale. Uh, I think this is going to be cool to look at. So yeah, keep keep an eye out for that one. A uh, quick shout out here to Linda Shea. She's put together a uh, Ethereum VR meetup with Trent Van Epps here. Uh, it's going to be hosted on Friday this week, January 29th at 4 p.m. Eastern time, uh, US Eastern time. So if you're interested in attending, you can sign up on, uh, on this sign up form here, which I'll link in the YouTube description. I've signed up. Luckily, I can attend this. It's only 8 a.m. 8 a.m. my time, um, so I, I can definitely attend this one. Usually, these events when they're scheduled on, like, especially the Eastern time in the U.S., they're like 3 or 4 a.m. So I can never attend them. But really glad I can attend this one. So if that's what you're interested in, definitely um, sign up here, and you'll you'll see me on there. So yeah, the links in the YouTube description. So interesting tweet from Lamboshi here. This wasn't a tweet from today. I think it was like four days ago. Um, he tweeted about the energy use of different kind of mining algorithms uh, compared to proof of stake. So he's got here, ETH through proof of stake only uses 1.4 gigawatt hours. Uh, Ethereum mining uses 16,000 gigawatt hours and Bitcoin mining uses 77,000 gigawatt hours. And then he goes on to say, it is easy to see which of the two consensus mechanisms is most compatible with the future. Now, I wrote more about this in the Daily Gway newsletter today. You can go read that. I'm not going to go into like the, the nitty-gritty details of what I wrote about. But this just speaks to the fact that, I mean, Proof of Stake has been on the Ethereum roadmap forever. And one of the main reasons it was there is because we wanted to go to a more greener, more sustainable consensus mechanism. Because mining, as you can see, uses a lot of power. The Bitcoin mining currently uses 0.5% of all worldwide electricity consumption, literally. Do you think 0.5% of the population actually use Bitcoin in their everyday lives? I don't think so. I don't think there's 0.5% of people in the world um, hold Bitcoin at this point. That would be hundreds, I think it's hundreds of millions of people or something like that, if I'm doing my math right. I don't think that we're at that point yet. Um, and even then, I mean, does that justify the energy expenditure? Now, obviously, Ethereum is not much better here. I think it's like one fourth or something of the energy use. But Ethereum hasn't planned to move off that. And we already have a proof of stake chain live. We just need to wait for the merger to happen. And you can see that the orders of magnitude difference here is, is, is extreme, right? Because with Ethereum proof of stake, you only need a simple kind of uh, simple hardware. You don't need a specialized mining machine, just general purpose hardware. And you don't need uh, lots of electricity to power this. And you don't need to power it like full capacity to get the, the juice out of your mining machine and to make the most kind of like returns. 
Um, so from that point of view, it, it uses electricity, but it, it doesn't use hardly anything compared to compared to what mining uses. So and, and on top of that, mining equipment actually is incredibly wasteful because you have to keep replacing it as, as time goes on because there's better mining equipment comes out that's more efficient, that'll make you more profitable. And then all the old mining equipment is literally waste. It doesn't get used for anything else. It gets put into, it, it just gets thrown out essentially. So that's another big aspect that I think people miss. It's not just the energy usage, it's also the massive amounts of waste that's produced by by Bitcoin mining. So I think over the coming couple of years, maybe, yeah, the next couple of years as kind of like this bull market heats up, as Bitcoin grows more, as its price goes up and more, it uses more electricity, there's going to be a lot of regulators that are going to take a look at this, a lot of governments that are going to take a look at this, and they're going to think, we're trying to combat climate change, yet we have this massive elephant in the room of you know of, of proof of work mining, and not just Bitcoin, any network that does proof of work mining. You know what can we do to 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 stop this, to regulate it? Now, obviously, no one can stop Bitcoin, right? It's very hard to stop Bitcoin. You know, maybe a motivated nation state or a motivated government like the U.S. government could, if they really wanted to, and they probably could today, if they really, really, really wanted to, and that was like their sole goal. I think they could, at least. You know, without banning Bitcoin from trading, I think they could uh, cripple the, the network if they wanted to. But outside of that, uh, I think it's just going to come under I- I- intense scrutiny here because they're going to be thinking to themselves, you know, this is just such a, a waste. It's, it pollutes everything, you know, and Bitcoin is going up against governments anyway, right? It's going up against central banks and, and their ability to print money and the government's ability to print money. So it's not like they're an innocent little kind of thing in the corner being like, please don't hurt me. I'm, I'm innocent, right? No, it's not like that at all. They're actually, Bitcoin launched the first attack. So from that point of view, I don't, I don't know. I think the next couple of years are going to get crazy. And I don't think enough people are talking about this. I, I think that mining is, 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 I mean, proof of work was a good kind of proof of concept that it kind of um, launched, obviously Bitcoin, it launched this whole industry. But if we can do proof of stake and and it's just as secure, um, then why not, right? Why stick to proof of work? And, you know, the, the Bitcoiners like to argue against this saying, you know, proof of work actually encourages, you know, green energy and cheap energy production, and it's actually good for the world. I've never seen a study or research done on that that wasn't biased, so it wasn't from a Bitcoin aligned publication. So if you've got something, send it to me because I haven't seen it yet. Um, and they also say that, oh yeah, Bitcoin uses this much energy, but so does all this other stuff that's wasteful. And I'm like, well, that's just what aboutism, and that's a really poor argument in my in my eyes. So I would really love to be proven wrong here uh, because I just I don't see how that that you can justify this much energy use for something that most of the world, or at least 99% of the world at this point in time, don't benefit from, right? So, you know, you can say, oh, this uses that this much energy. They usually say that um, the, the entire traditional finance system uses more energy than Bitcoin. And it's like, well, I mean, yeah, it, it powers the entire globe. Like everyone uses it, right? <laughs> so I don't understand where that argument's coming from. It's just a, a super weird argument. But yeah, I, I'll digress for now. I've got a few more thoughts in the newsletter. So you can go read that if you want to um, learn more about uh, what I what I think about this. So Set, uh, us here at Set today, uh, launched a uh, asset management suite uh, after three months of it being in public beta. So what this means is that now anyone can create their own tokenized basket or their own set, uh, have people invest in it, they can implement their own fees, and they can also access the rest of DeFi through various integrations. Now, we've already seen a bunch of people create their own sets, which is really cool. People were dying to do this for a long time. I mean, people have asked us for this feature for a very, very long time. And we finally felt comfortable enough to release it to the wild, uh, which is which is really, really cool. So if that's something you're interested in and you want to create your own set, create your own fund, I guess, on chain without having to go through our team, it's now permissionless, permissionless to do so. Um, and you can see the integrations we have here. You, you can trade using SushiSwap, Uniswap, 0x, uh, Kaiba, 1inch. You can participate in governance of different protocols, lend out on Aave, charge fees, there's so much going on here. This is actually, you know, I mean, one of the most exciting releases that we've had in quite a while. And I was really, really glad to see this go out there. So if that's something you're interested in, definitely go check it out because, uh, you know, you can you can literally in a few clicks 
using a really nice interface, create your own basket, create your own tokenized fund, and then get investors. Maybe you want to help your family or something or have your friends do it. You can just send them this link and you they can and then they can um, kind of like invest in it. Or they, you know, maybe they send you money and you invest in it for them, but you have like this whole kind of um, a management suite here so that you don't have to manage like all these different kind of crude addresses and stuff like that. You can just put it into this, um, this pool of capital and then kind of work it from there. So definitely go check that out if that's something you're interested in. So Dune, Analytic posted, uh, Dune Analytics posted this tweet today about there being uh, over 1.5 million die is now being issued uh, by the MakerDAO system, which is now backed by $4.5 billion worth of collateral. Now, this is obviously not just ETH collateral, it's also USDC and a bunch of other tokens. You can actually see the collateral here. Um, you know, there's, I mean, there's a lot of tokens in there now, like ZeroX, KNC, BAT, Wi-Fi, there's tons in here. And of course, the stable coins as well. Um, but I thought this was really cool. I mean, the Maker project has been growing so quickly um, over the past year, even though the MKR token price has done barely anything up until recently. So it's actually really funny to see the fundamentals continue to get, you know, explosively better, whereas the token price isn't reflecting that. Maybe not up until recently, I guess. So that's like kind of a divide there. But what I think is also interesting is that I don't know if da how much DAI is being used as a stable coin rather than being used as cheap leverage. Because at the moment, Maker is the cheapest place to get leverage uh, on chain. Because if you put your ETH into Compound or Aave, you have this kind of higher rate on stable coins. So I think to borrow like a stable coin, whether it be USDC or DAI, is 7 or 8% last time I checked. Whereas using ETH on Maker and borrowing against that is 3.5%. So, and it was much cheaper. It was like 2% a couple of weeks ago. So I think DAI, I mean, I don't know. I'd like to see how much people are actually using DAI as just like a stable coin, right? Rather than a way to get cheap leverage or at least the maker system as a way to get cheap leverage because I think that's what people are doing. Um, because, you know, you can look at all the assets locked in there. It's a lot of ETH. A lot of ETH holders obviously don't want to sell their ETH because ETH is going up, but they want to play maybe in DeFi, right? They want to buy some DeFi tokens. And it's a really good tax advantage way to do it as well because by putting your ETH into Maker, and this isn't tax advice, but how it works for me in Australia is that by putting my ETH into Maker, it's not a taxable event. By borrowing assets against it, not a taxable event. The only taxable event is if I buy something with those dollars, I make a profit, right? And then I'm taxed on those as capital gains. So... That is, you know, instead of me having to sell my ETH, incur like capital gains tax and then reset my cost basis and all this mess. So I think that's why it's very, very popular. Um, but that doesn't take away from its growth. I think that's how MakerDAO works, right? It requires people to want cheap leverage or to want to take out loans and stuff like that. So yeah, I, I don't think it takes away from their growth at all. So kudos to Maker, onwards to 2 billion die and, and you know, get, getting uh, further along from that as well. So interesting tweet from Giorgios today about EIP-1559. And this is an undercovered aspect of 1559. So what the opcode, the base fee opcode will allow for, um, it will allow smart contracts to estimate congestion on chain uh, by comparing the historical base fee behavior. And then they'll be able to prog programmatically adjust parameters such as dispute periods in optimistic rollups. Now, I mean, this is quite technical. You may not understand exactly what he's saying here. So I'll try to break it down as best I can. Basically, it acts as an on-chain Oracle for the gas market. So you can imagine, you know, Oracles that power DeFi today and power all of Ethereum today that give you the price of like ETH, that give you the price of a stable coin. Obviously, Chainlink is a big project in this space, or at least, you know, the biggest and leading project in this space. So what 1559 will do with this opcode is it allows smart contracts to tap into it and basically be able to use that as an on-chain oracle to uh, estimate kind of, um, you know, uh, kind of like how they're doing gas for users on the user side. And now he mentions optimistic rollups as well, which is a layer two technology. I'm not an expert on here, so I might get this wrong. But from my understanding, uh, the dispute period within optimistic rollups is, you know, it can be up to a week. So it, it basically is a period where anyone can challenge the um, the withdrawal or something that happens on the optimistic rollup before it gets settled on the, on layer one Ethereum for kind of fraud and things like that. Um, and by, by, uh, by getting the, the smart contracts and the rollups to talk to 
this opcode to to kind of measure congestion and things like that, they can better do these dispute resolutions. So yeah, this is something that's quite technical, but I think is very important because just another reason why we need 1559. Gas burning, better fee estimation for users, better fee UX, right? Um, you know, aligning incentives between uh, all the parties on the network makes it so you can only pay ETH for, for fees on the network. And now having this on-chain kind of gas price oracle or, or kind of like, um, uh, I guess, like gas market oracle is just another thing that, that's exciting about 1559. So that it's, not, it's not wrong to say this is the biggest upgrade that Ethereum has ever seen in its entire history on, on, on ETH1, at least in, in the network, besides ETH2, of course. So very, very, very excited for this to go live. As I've said in the past, my heavy speculation is that we're going to see it around July, but we'll see how it pans out. Giving any sorts of dates within Ethereum is not great, right? There's always been delays. But I'm optimistic, right? You could, yeah, very optimistic because Tim Biko is leading it and I've spoken about him a lot and I really trust him to get the work done. So really looking forward to, to that going live. So lastly here, a little bit of drama. So Niraj from Coin Center uh, posted this tweet today and I'll read the tweet out. Quote, some people on Clubhouse are mad because I said Ethereum is not a scam. So I'll say it again, Ethereum is not a scam, end quote. Now, obviously, if you've been in the Ethereum ecosystem for a while, you'll know this all too well. A lot of people actually think that Ethereum is a scam, right? Not as a joke. They don't think it's just like a bad idea or anything like that. They think it's a legitimate scam that should be taken down and they compare it to Theranos, right? That, that massive scam uh, that went on in the traditional startup world. And it's just so bizarre, right? You can think Ethereum is a broken system. You can think it's dumb. You can think DeFi is dumb. I mean, I don't know why you would think that, but you can think that. That's fine. That's, an, that's your opinion. But for you to call Ethereum a scam in the face of overwhelming evidence to the contrary is just so bizarre. Like, I just don't get it, right? And I don't actually think that these people really believe that Ethereum is a scam. Maybe some of them do, but I think they use this as a, as a kind of defensive mechanism against kind of like having to accept that Ethereum is going to exist, right? And it's going to exist uh, just as long as Bitcoin's going to exist. And I think what burns these people the most is that they can't kill Ethereum and they can't kill Ethereum for the same reason they can't kill Bitcoin, which is the ultimate irony here. So I just, I mean, I don't want to dive too deep into this, but it's just, it's so insane to me that people still think this. These people are missing so much of what goes on within Ethereum, so much of the developments, they're missing world-changing technology because they're stuck in their bubble, they're stuck in bias, right? They're, they're stuck being, for, for lack of a better term, maximalists, which I just think is is bizarre. And I, I just think it, it, it's really detrimental to, to the space. So, you know, and a lot of these people, pretty much all of them are, are, are Bitcoin maximalists, right? Like there's no sugarcoating it here. So they're, I mean, in my opinion, they're not worth paying attention to. They're not worth listening to. If they can't have critical arguments or critical thought around Ethereum and can accept that it's not a scam, then they're not worth listening to. And a lot of them don't have any good arguments because a lot of them don't even understand how Ethereum works, which, which is even, even funnier. So, you know, how can you call something a scam if you don't know how it works? And it was even funnier is that the arguments that kind of Bitcoin maximalists use against Ethereum are the same arguments that people that aren't into crypto use against Bitcoin to, to detract from, from its properties, right? Bitcoin was called a scam for a very long time. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't expect a lot of these people to not call, uh, to stop calling Ethereum a scam. They're going to keep doing it, whatever. That's, it is what it is. Uh, and I mean, it really doesn't matter at the end of the day. Ethereum continues unabated. Uh, DeFi continues, right? The explosive growth is going to continue. And all of the kind of like, I guess, moderate Bitcoiners pretty much accept Ethereum and like Ethereum. It's just the real kind of like ones on the on the maximalist end of the spectrum that they kind of think it's still a scam. So whatever, we don't need those people. They're, they're, we don't need the negative, negativity within the ecosystem. So yeah. Anyway, I digress for now. Uh, that's it for today's episode. So thank you everyone for listening and watching. If you haven't yet, give the video a thumbs up, subscribe to the YouTube channel, subscribe to the Daily Wayne newsletter, join the Discord channel, and I will catch you all tomorrow. Thanks everyone.